paper birch kind of describes itself. It has real peely bark that comes off very easily off of it. Uh, it tends to be kind of bone white with these black accents on it. The bark on the outside of the tree is white like this and when you peel it off the inside will be kind of flesh colored, you know, kind of that peachy orange. And this is the bark that Indians used to make canoes out of. You don't find a ton of paper birch in western New York. It's kind of close to the southern edge of its range. Up in Maine you'd find entire forests of paper birch. It's unlikely that you'll mistake a paper birch tree for anything else, but you might mistake something else for a paper birch tree. And we have a good example right nearby. Here's our cluster of paper birch and right next to them is a quaking aspen. And the similarity between the two is that uh, they have white bark on them. You notice the aspen has no peeliness to it at all. The higher up the tree you go, the whiter the bark gets. As opposed to the birch trees, which are peely all the way up. Hey, look at that. I found a living branch I could pull down. So, uh, yeah, the leaves have that teardrop shape to them. They're not quite heart shaped. And the twigs have alternate twig spacing. That means on a twig you'll have them growing out first one side, then the other, then the other, then the other back and forth. You'll never have pairs of twigs or pairs of leaf buds on a twig. This is a yellow birch. In New England this is a fairly important cash crop. Here in New York it's it's not that valuable because it's not that common. This is getting close to the southern edge of its range. Uh, it doesn't grow that well most of the time. So you find it here and there in certain woods, uh, but not in any appreciable quantity. It has peely bark the way that birch usually do. And the freshly peeled bark will show the yellowish tinge that will get to it. The yellow birch leaf is fairly similar to a paper birch leaf. Uh, it has a somewhat teardrop shape to it. It's uh, serrated along the edge of it. It's doubly serrated. It has big teeth and little teeth in between. If you're ever unsure that the tree you're looking at is a yellow birch, what you do is find a green twig, break it off, and smell the broken end. And what you should smell is a strong odor of wintergreen. Um, if you've ever heard of birch beer, that soda pop they sell, uh, bir this is the birch that they make birch beer from. And in fact, in Europe, it's a, a tradition over there that they tap yellow birch for syrup the way that they do maple trees here. Uh, it's an intriguing thing to me. The one thing that keeps me from getting serious about wanting to try tapping yellow birch for syrup is that uh, you have to boil 70 gallons of yellow birch sap to make one gallon of syrup as opposed to 40 gallons of maple sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. Quite a lot of work. This is a black birch tree and black birch will not be as peely as yellow birch. Uh, sometimes the bark uh, is formed such that you can peel paper off of it, but not this particular one. Here's a close-up view of black birch bark. Down near the bottom, you can see it's just starting to get that peely character that many birch trees have. Like it'll, It gets a little bit flaky never quite gets the peely paper that other birch trees do. It's fairly easy to confuse with pin cherry or, or a young black cherry because uh, it's similar color, kind of similar uh, bark character. But there's one dead giveaway. If you're ever confused whether the tree you're looking at is a black birch or any kind of cherry, 
is uh, like a yellow birch. If you break a green twig and give it a sniff, you'll smell a strong smell of wintergreen. Uh, that's that's any season of the year you ought to smell that. Cherry has kind of a pungent, not very pleasant smell to it, so there's no confusing the smell of the two different species. Now here's a black birch leaf. It looks like every other birch leaf that we've seen thus far. And I'll compare it with this yellow birch leaf. And there's variation in the morphology of the leaves within the species itself. I'm shooting on the Finger Lakes Trail and I just stumbled across this trail register. I think I better sign up and describe what I was doing. Here's a black locust tree. This is the tree they use to make the fence posts with. The bark has lots of ridges and they're kind of woven into each other. It's a fairly thick bark most of the time. It just has that woven appearance to it. Black locust leaves are compound leaves and the components of the compound leaf are small lobes. They give you a very sparse crown. You'll get a lot of dappled light through it. So it's kind of nice in a backyard because you get incomplete shade from them. But what makes locusts not so great in the backyard is their seed pods. Now in the late spring they'll drop these pods that sort of look like pea pods or bean pods. They're long and skinny and they drop them all over the place. I'm sorry for these specimens being a bit ratty but it is mid-September and uh, these leaves are getting ready to drop off so that's how they're going to look everywhere you go. Uh, locust has a compound leaf meaning the leaf is members that make up a whole. You have a main stem running up the middle and these oval leaves that are in pairs running up your main stem. There's no serrations at all. They're almost football shaped they're not pointy at the tip though. And just that leaf form is what contributes to uh, locust trees having that dappled canopy that they characteristically have. This is a pretty big one, but I have seen them get bigger than this. Uh, interestingly, they're not used as saw timber. Uh, no one saws these into boards. They're primarily used as fence posts. Uh, but the hop farms have started using them as their poles to grow the hops on. The defining trait of locust lumber is its weather resistance and resistance to rot. So that's why its primary use is as cattle fencing. You can stick one end in the ground and it'll remain sound for decades. So that's what they nail their barbed wire to. When you're finding willow trees, you're almost guaranteed to have water nearby, as is the case here. These trees are black willow, not to be confused with a Chinese weeping willow. They always have a, a, a haphazard form to them. They're, they're never straight and tall, they're just kind of branchy and leaning and they're often broken because they don't have a lot of strength. They don't hold up in storms very well. You can see how they get awful big and they, they're often covered in vines, covered with poison ivy and uh, they grow real fast. Black willow leaves are long and slender like this towards the end of the season so they have a ragamuffin look to them right now they're just about ready to fall off but you can see them from a long ways away they're just have that classic shape they do tend to droop a little bit in the early 20th century the Dutch elm disease showed up and decimated many of the elm trees that were quite prevalent at the time but they didn't wipe them out completely Nowadays you can find elm everywhere, 
but it's far more likely that you'll find a young tree than a mature one. Elm will spring up just about anywhere, but they just kind of live till they die. Eventually the Dutch elm disease gets them in the end. But it's kind of a crapshoot as far as how long they'll grow before that happens. When I think of a typical elm leaf, I think of a good sized leaf like this. Uh, it's vaguely football shaped yet not quite symmetrical. Uh, it'll have big teeth on them and, and you'll have large teeth and small, small teeth in between the large teeth on the fringes of the leaf like that. The veins are really prominent. But take a look at the difference between this elm leaf that I picked and these elm leaves that I pulled from behind my shed. They're much, much smaller. Well, it's, just, uh, it's just variation from within the species. As it turns out, these leaves were so different because they're from the Siberian elm, a species I was unfamiliar with before. They were just so different I had to look them up. My knowledge of trees is limited to those that I have practical experience with and behind my house is an old canal bed which is probably where these exotic seeds were brought in from. Here I am 30 years into a forestry career and I'm still learning new stuff. I'm always telling landowners that I can spot an elm tree from half a mile away. They tend to grow up within hedgerows, those few hedgerows that remain around here, and take on an unmistakable form. There's a beautiful word that describes their shape deliquescent, which means shaped like a bouquet of flowers in a vase. Despite being a native species, in western New York larch trees are almost always found in a plantation. So they have something of a monoculture where they were planted years ago. Now these larch look like they've been stressed from the hot summer that we've had. Uh, they are something of a northern species, and we've had an awful lot of 90 degree weather this year, so uh, the needles are a bit sparse on them. Larch is the only evergreen tree that I know of that isn't evergreen. They have needles, like any conifer would, but these needles will turn yellow in the fall and drop off. So uh, a stand of larch in the middle of winter will look like a bunch of dead trees because their limbs will have no needles on them. Larch needles have a very characteristic way of growing. They're, they're little whorls of needles that come, that, that radiate from a point. Now all these clumps of needles you see begin from one origin. Being a conifer tree, the larch has a cone that it drops. A larch goes by several different names. In some parts of the country they call it tamarack. Uh, in some parts of Maine they call it hackmatack. Larch bark is fairly flaky and when you pop a flake off it's kind of reddish underneath like that. Often has little dead twigs on it or places where dead twigs have broken out. Larch trees have a form to them where the limbs are quite slender and loggers enjoy cutting this stuff because often when a large tree hits the ground a lot of these limbs will break off thus saving them a lot of mechanical limbing after they've cut a tree. Large trees can grow really big and quite tall and they have beautiful blood red lumber in them uh, that's quite weather resistant, has a lot of pitch in it uh, but it is among all of the softwood trees available in New York State, this is the most prized and the most commercially valuable. That smaller crooked tree you see in the middle is a sassafras tree. This is indeed the tree that they use to make sassafras tea. You can see how furrowed and ridged the bark is. And wherever a piece of bark flaked away, it's kind of reddish. Typically you'll see them kind of small like this, but I have seen sassafras that were a foot and a half through before. All three of these are leaves from the same sassafras tree. They can be 
tongue shaped. They can be shaped sort of like a hand puppet or they can be shaped like a boxing glove. Just some variation in the, in the, the form of the leaf. And when you break a sassafras twig and smell the broken end, it'll have a, a kind of a spicy smell to it. It's aromatic and quite pleasant. This might sound funny, but I would almost compare the smell to that of Fruit Loop cereal. Yes, I was a sugar cereal junkie when I was a kid.